you try turning off that screen?
And we are back on the record on People v. James Crumbly, docket number 21006651, People v. Jennifer Crumbly, docket number 21006652. Now the appearance is on the record, starting with the prosecutor. Karen McDonald, appearing on behalf of the people. Thank you, Mark. Peace on behalf of the people. Good afternoon, Your Honor. I'm Shannon Smith on behalf of Jennifer Crumbly. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Mari Elman on behalf of James Crumbly. Okay, uh, we are uh, returning from a lunch break, and are all parties ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, sir. Okay. If everybody in the gallery would please have a seat, there's plenty of room to be seated. Um, sir, you are still under oath. Okay. Understood. Okay, Mr. Hopkins, um, earlier when you were testifying, you testified about being a mandatory reporter. Is that correct? Correct. And you would agree with me that that is a responsibility you take seriously. Yes. And when something needs to be reported, you absolutely report it and file the 3200 form you're supposed to file, correct? Correct. And in this case, obviously, you did not file those forms. It did not rise to the level where you felt a 3200 had to be filed, correct? Yes. And uh, with that, um, your main concern was about Ethan's uh, suicidal ideation and my understanding is that's different than him uh, being an active suicidal person. Is that correct? Correct. And with um, the suicidal ideation, going to therapy as soon as possible would have satisfied or helped the problem that you thought existed. Is that correct? Yes. And that's why um, Ethan was not forced to leave school, correct? There was no discipline issue, correct. Okay, and if mental illness could also be a sickness, there was no illness that caused him, illness reason that caused him to have to leave either, correct? I, I misunderstand. Please rephrase what you're saying. Discipline is not the only reason a child would have to leave school. Ethan did not did not have to leave school that day, period, correct? Correct. You were concerned about the suicidal ideation, um, and you testified that Ethan uh, would have gone into his, is it fifth hour after being in your office? Third hour. I'm sorry, third hour and then fourth hour and lunch, is that correct? Correct. Did you notify his uh, teachers in the third hour, fourth hour, or anyone in the lunchroom that you believed he might have suicidal ideation? No. And you obviously didn't do that because you didn't think there was any reason to have to uh, protect him in any extra way, correct? No, I would want him to be with people. You Okay, so him being with people was what was important, correct? Correct. And that's why him going home alone and having his parents be working would also not have been ideal, correct? Correct. You testified a little bit about the parents and how they interacted with you, how they behaved in the office. It's fair to say that Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly were not parents that were frequently in your office. Is that correct? Correct. In fact, this was the first time that you had ever uh, had interaction with Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly. Yes. I imagine there are other students whose parents you may see more frequently. Is that a fair statement? Yes. And on those parents, um, you may have ideas of what to expect uh, or not expect based on what you know of them, correct? Based on the other parents' behavior? I'm saying you know you would be able to predict other parents better that you've been around many times. Correct. And so when it comes to Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly, these are people you don't know um, except for your interaction with them on, on this particular day, correct? Correct. And in your uh, assessment, with all of your training, with all of your experience, um, you, would, you would not have done anything different than what you did that day. Is that correct? As far as alerting the parents about their student having suicidal ideation, that is what I would have done that day. And that's what you did? Correct. Okay, and aside from that though, 
there's not any other thing that you think you should have done or would have done um, done differently that day. I'm confused. Are you just asking in general? Yeah. I want that situation to be as different as possible. I acted off the information I had available. You acted off the information you had available and you acted in a way that was making the best decision with the information you had at the time, correct? Yes. Thank you. Um, any questions on behalf of James Trumbull? One moment, Your Honor. <clears throat> Nothing for Mr. Trumbull, Your Honor. Any redirect? Yes. Mr. Hopkins, counsel spent a lot of time before lunch talking to you about what you knew. Yes. I want to I want to talk a little bit about all of what you knew and what you didn't know. Okay. So I have some questions for you. Did you know that Jennifer and that James Crumbly had recently purchased a weapon for Ethan? No. That's absolutely in evidence. There's, um, we just had testimony that uh, the gun was purchased. We've already introduced um, exhibits showing that both Jennifer and Ethan posted about his gun. Jennifer texted him that day about, or the day before, your gun. So I, it's a question of fact, but it's absolutely relevant. Um, did you know they bought him a gun for an early Christmas present? No. Did you know that gun was identical to the drawing of the gun on that worksheet? No. Did mom or dad ever tell you that they bought that gun for him recently? Just no. four days prior? No. Did you know he posted on Instagram about his new, his new gun? No. Did you know that he had been experiencing hallucinations in the several months prior to this? No. Did mom and dad ever tell you that he had any significant mental health issues? No. Did you know that he spent hours and hours by himself at home? Objection, no. Your Honor. That has not been proven. The prosecution keeps asking this question. There has not been testimony to show that. And I'm going to sustain the objection. Let's move on, please. Did you know that the Crumbleys spent two to three hours a night, three to four times a week at the stable without their son? No. Did you know that... Uh, Did you, well, I'm gonna go back. Did, when dad said about the journal, did, did you know that written in that journal was a lot of really disturbing things? No. Did, did dad seem to understand that Ethan would write about his feelings in that journal? That was how I understood it. Okay. Did you, were you aware that Ethan had texted, I'm sorry, did, were you aware that Ethan had um, texted his mom about seeing demons? No. Were you aware that he texted his mom about things flying off shelves? No. Were you aware that he had asked several times to see a therapist? No. Were you aware that he thought he was having a mental breakdown at some point? No. Were you aware that he told his parents that? I object to the question about several times to see a therapist. There are not, Ethan has never asked his parents several times to see a therapist. The prosecutor is taking that from text messages between Ethan and somebody else and I'm just, I'm just that objection. Your Honor, first of all, she just talked about what her parent, what he did, said to her clients. That's testimony. They haven't testified to that. And second of all, we've already introduced text messages where Ethan is, is telling his friend several times that he's telling mom and dad he needs help and he's having a mental Please. breakdown. Right. Okay. Uh, did you, were you aware that Ethan had texted his friend that, um, he talked to his mom about getting help and she laughed at him? No. Objection. I don't believe that has, I don't believe that text has come in as evidence. Well. There uh, is not, that, the fact that mom laughed at him about therapy is, is not a part of the evidence in this case. There was, during the course of some cross-examination, it did come in. And the redirect of, of um, The exhibit itself didn't come in, but there was testimony regarding it. With no objection, Your Honor. 
were you aware that he he told his friend that he talked to his mom about getting help and she laughed at him? No. Your Honor, objection. This is, again, going back to what he said to his friend. That is not saying it to his parent and having his parent, the parent laugh. I'll note that for the record, that correction was that that was a statement he made to his friend. I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make that really clear, Your Honor. Were you aware that he texted his friend that he talked to his dad about having a mental breakdown and that he texted his friend that his dad said, suck it up? No. Were you aware that his mom, Jennifer Crumbly, just the day before texted Ethan, you have to learn, LOL, you have to learn not to get caught? No. Were you aware that he had access to the gun and ammunition? No. Objection. Your Honor, the day before, Mr. Hopkins has already testified that the day before, well, there's two objections actually. First, um, that he had access to the gun. That's the first objection. The second objection is um, Mr. Hopkins testified differently when he was talking about the meeting on November 29th because he indicated that Ethan clearly told him on November 29th he had gone to the shooting range with his mother the weekend before and that he understood that Ethan was shooting guns as a hobby. So that, what Ms. Ms. McDonald is asking is not an accurate question, and we're also objecting to the accessibility again. Response to the objection. I'm not sure so what are this- you, Are you objecting to facts not in evidence as it relates to the accessibility issue? Yes, yes. Your Honor. Okay, go ahead and respond to the objection as facts not in evidence regarding the accessibility issue. I think the fact that uh, Ethan Crumbly and it, it has that gun and had that gun that day and that it was purchased for him shows that he had access to the gun. I, I'm going to sustain the objection as to that question. Mr. Hopkins, were you aware that Ethan Crumbly was not on his parents' health insurance? No. Were you aware that he hadn't been to the doctor in several years? Objection! That is not evidence in this case, and it's not true. You're, were you aware that in rephrasing? I'll rephrase, Your Honor. Uh, were you aware that despite Ethan telling his friend that he had asked several times for mental health and they thought he was having a nervous breakdown, that there's no evidence in all of the text messages with his mother that he ever went to the doctor? No. Okay. Were you aware that Ethan told, texted his friend that mom thought he was on drugs? No. Did, did Jennifer or James Crumbly ever tell you in that meeting with their son that he had just, they had just purchased a gun for him? No. Did they ever ask to look in his backpack and see what was in there? No. Did they ever ask uh, let you know that he was having a lot of trouble at home? No. Did they ever ask to see that video that counsel asked you about? No. Did they ever uh, ask about anything specific about the worksheet? They did not ask anything specific about the worksheet. Dad looked at the worksheet. Did they ever ask you what uh, suicide ideation was? No. Did they ever seem concerned for the safety of their son? Not in the immediacy, no. Okay, nothing further. Your Honor, if I may just briefly recap, thank you, Judge. Mr. Hopkins, the prosecutor was just asking you a bunch of questions about the things that you didn't know. Now, is it your understanding that, let me back up, you testified about your education and training as it relates to psychology, is that accurate? Uh, counseling. Counseling, okay. And you've worked with teenagers, you were a youth pastor previously? Yes. Okay, and so you've worked with teenagers for a, a long, since about 2009, did I hear that correctly? Yes. Okay. You have a lot of experience with teenagers, is that fair? Fair. And based on all of your experience with teenagers, based on your counseling, education, and training, at no time in your interactions with Ethan Crumbly did you feel that he was a threat to anyone else other than himself. Is that fair? Correct. 
you didn't ask, despite the fact that you knew that Ethan had gone to the shooting range with his mother the weekend before, you didn't ask Ethan or, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. or Mrs. Crumbly about a, a handgun. Is that fair? I did not ask them about their gun, no. And you didn't ask them if they knew where it was? I did not. You didn't ask them if they thought that Ethan would take it? No. You didn't ask them anything about it. Is that accurate? About their specific handgun? Yes. I did not ask about their gun, no. About any gun? I did not ask them about guns, no. <laughs> and the prosecutor was asking you questions about what you didn't know about text messages between Ethan and his friend. Is, do, you remember, do you recall those numerous questions? Yes. At no time did you ask Mr. or Mrs. Crumbly if they were aware of any issues with their son. Is that fair? I was alerting them to issues about their son. Okay, yes. You alerted them to an issue that you had been made aware of on November 30th. Is that accurate? Yes. And you advised them that they should seek counseling for their child? Yes. And they agreed? They agreed, but they did not agree to do it immediately. They agreed to seek counseling for their child based on your recommendation. Is that an accurate statement? Yes. Thank you. No further questions, Your Honor. Just briefly, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Hopkins, if you, if you meet with the child and you've got concerns about that student, what is the, the, the last resort in terms of making sure he's safe? What do you, what do, you do? Absolute last resort? Yes. 911. Okay. And what would what would that what would a student look like for you to have to for you to call nine one one? It would have to be a medical emergency. And when you bring parents in, and you've done this in the past, we talked about this earlier. Do you just give them information, or do they talk about their their child? Your Honor, objection. This so far exceeds the scope of recross. I disagree, Your Honor. She just got up and asked about what he would do, why he felt that the child was, there was no concerns, that, that mom and dad didn't, I think the assumption is, did nothing wrong, that it was Mr. Hopkins that did something wrong, but I have a right to ask him what he did or didn't do because they just crossed again on it. Let's answer that question and we'll time this up. I'll rephrase. Who's the best person to find out about a student other than the student? The parents. Thank you. Right. Um, you may step down. Any, any reason why this witness can be excused last year? No, you are. Any objection? No, you are. Call your next witness, please. Thank you. Mr. Dylan O'Connell. Name again? Dylan O'Connell. Dylan O'Connell. We had a bit of an issue with the projector. We're going to try it again. Do you saw Ms. Fair any testimony of going to deal with the truth under the penalty of perjury? I do. Please have a seat. <coughs> and if you will state and spell both your first and last name for the record. Uh, my name is Dylan O'Connell, D-I-L-L-O-N, last name O'Connell, O-C-O-N-N-E-L-L. Thank you, Judge. <coughs> Sir, is it fair to say that you work at a business that sells uh, firearms and ammunition? Correct. And is there also a, uh, a place there for target shooting? Correct. Okay. So how long have you worked there? Um, about a year and a half. And what is your current position? Uh, office manager, bookkeeper. Okay. So you would be the person if someone were to inquire about uh, certain records, you could pull that? Correct. All right. Um, and your company does keep receipts for purchases? We do. And also for range time? Correct. 
is your company equipped with an internal CCTV recording system? Yes, we are. Okay, that's that's capable of being recorded to watch at a later date? Yes. And was it operation on, on November the 27th of 2021? Yes, it was. Okay. I'd like to direct your attention to December the 1st of 2021. On that date, were you contacted by special agents of the ATF to review certain records from your business? We were. Okay. And did those agents come and meet with you at your store? They did. Uh, did were you given information to search by those agents? Given information? I'm, well, let I'm me sorry. ask you this. You were made aware at some point of this, the school shooting in Oxford High School on November the 30th of 2021? That's correct. Okay. And after that shooting occurred, were you provided with certain information to search for your company's records? We were, yes. Okay. And in fact, were you requested to pull a receipt for ammunition and range time from November the 27th, 2021, purchased by Jennifer Crumbly? We were. Okay. And did you provide that information to the ATF? Yes. Uh, a copy of the receipt. Okay, and is that the receipts of November the 27th, 2021? Um, and does it have an in, a, a name of an individual who purchased items from your store? Yes, it does. Okay, and is that receipt fairly accurately depict what you pulled for your company's internal systems for the ATF? It does. People move to admit 39. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. Be admitted. I'm going to attempt to publish it. Sir, I'll just refer you to, to the actual exhibit in front okay. of you there. Um, can you tell us from that receipt what was purchased from your store on November the 27th, 2021? Um, yes, there was um, a, by the information provided, uh, a half an hour of range time, uh, one additional paper target, and then uh, two boxes of ammunition. Okay, what caliber ammunition? Uh, nine millimeter. Were you also requested to review the surveillance recordings from that day? I was. And does your um, <clears throat> internal system, does the surveillance footage capture both the lobby as well as the range? It does. Okay. And did you provide that information to the ATF? I did. Did you make any additions, modifications, or deletions to that footage prior to turning it over? No, I did not. Okay. Judge, that is Exhibit 40. We do have a stipulation that it is a condensed version of the video that this witness turned over to the ATF. It's approximately nine minutes long. I'm going to ask the court to view it at the bench because I don't believe publishing it with the way the projector is will help. I have it on a flash drive. May I approach? Long. This is, for the record, again, the condensed version that Detective Ogrowski put together and the parties have stipulated to its admission. Thank you, Judge. I'll play it on my
Mr. Connell, again, that, that video is from November the 27th, 2021? That is correct. Okay. Thank you. I have nothing further. May I approach with further uh, some yes. Cross on behalf of uh, Jennifer Conley. Um, Your Honor, could uh, Mr. Conley's lawyer go first? I believe she has more questions for Mr. Cross on behalf of uh, James Conley. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Mr. Conley. Good afternoon. I, I am going to keep this brief. Okay. Um, you said that you're an office manager. You deal with records, is that fair? Um, some, yes, somewhat. Okay. But you're familiar with the goings-on within the, the store and the shooting range? Yes. Okay. I, I, I don't really work over there, but I, I'm familiar. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and you're familiar that people come in and bring their children to go to the shooting range. Is that accurate? Correct. Okay. And there's nothing illegal about that, is there? Correct. And they let their children use... Firearms, is that correct? Correct. And that's not illegal either? Correct. You know that people, and I don't, I assume you're somewhat familiar with shooting ranges and firearms and shooting guns as a hobby, is that fair? A bit, okay. yes. So you know that people go to the shooting range as a hobby? Yes. And some go often? Correct. Um, I mean, do some go multiple times a week? Yes. And some don't go so often. Is that fair as well? Yes. Now, the receipts that you provided, um, you obviously provided the one receipt on November 27th of 2021. Correct. You didn't provide any, or I'm sorry, the prosecution didn't provide any other receipts to you today. Is that accurate? That is correct. Okay. And did you review all of the receipts when you were reviewing the records related to James and Jennifer Crumbly? I did not. If I were to say that James or Jennifer Crumbly went to the shooting range three or four times in a matter of five or six months, that doesn't sound like a lot to you, does it? I'm sorry, three or four in five or six? Three or four times in five or six months. Doesn't sound like a lot. I, I would agree. And just to be clear, obviously, if it were illegal for a minor to shoot a handgun in your shooting range, you all would not allow that. Is that fair? Correct. So it was not illegal for Jennifer Crumbly to have Ethan Crumbly shooting a gun at your shooting range, correct? That is correct. No further questions, Your Honor. Any questions on the other side of the No, thank you, Judge. Any redress? Just very briefly. Mr. Connell, what does someone need to do to bring a minor into the shooting range to shoot? Um, they just have to fill out our waiver form as a as a parent or guardian with the with the minor's information. Okay, and that's what Jennifer Crumley did on November the twenty seventh of twenty one. As as far as I know, yes. Okay, so if they would have been at the range in prior months, like counsel just just asked, um, they would have each time filled out a waiver and asserted that there are that minor's parent or guardian and they are with that person. Well, we would have had it on file and we would have selected that information in in our system. Right. Because it's illegal for a 15-year-old just to show up and, and shoot on their own, right? That is correct. Right. Okay. Nothing further. I just have one follow-up question. Um, you were talking about the waiver that was filled out. In this case, the waiver was actually filled out by Dad uh, months prior to Jennifer Crumbly coming in. Is that is that correct? The the waiver, I, I believe so. Okay. I, believe I just wanted to verify on that day Jennifer did not fill out a waiver, but there was one on file. I, I don't know. Unfortunately, when, when her waiver form was filled out, I don't have that information. Okay, thank you. You may step down. Thank you. Any uh, reason why this can't be excused? Not for the people, thank you. No, Judge. No, you're right. Thank you. People call Detective Adam Stoyt.
Can you tell me, sir, in testimony of when he will be the truth under the penalty of perjury? I do. Have a seat, please. So please state and spell both the first and last name for the Adam Stoyak, A D A M S T O Y E K. S T O Y E K. Okay, I'm going to ask you to keep your voice up as loud as possible. Um, as you know, we do have microphones in front of you. One does record, one does amplify. It is necessary for us all to be able to hear what you're saying um, at all times. Okay? okay. Thank you, Judge. I'm going to do my best with the projector. May I proceed, Judge? Sir, um, what is your occupation? Uh, detective with the Oakland County Sheriff's Office. And how long have you been a detective with the Oakland County Sheriff's Office? Two years. <clears throat> What's your uh, current, um, well, where's your, your current assignment at? What substation? The Pontiac substation. Pontiac, okay. And uh, you've been in the Pontiac DB, with Detective Bureau, the whole time you've been a detective? Yes, sir. Okay. And how long have you been an officer with the, or sheriff's deputy with the Oak County Sheriff's Office? Just under 10 years. <clears throat> now, I want to direct your attention to November the 30th, 2021. Were you working that day? I was. Um, were you made aware of the Oxford High School shooting while you were working? I was. Okay. And what did you do when you were made aware of that information? Uh, my partner and I got into our uh, county issued vehicle and went to the Oxford High School. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yep. Okay, so November 30th, 2021, you were working that day? I was. And you were made aware of the shooting at the Oxford High School? I was. And did you respond to the school? I did. Okay, you said with a partner? Yes. And who's that? Uh, Detective McPherson. Okay. And tell me, please, what did you do when you first responded? Uh, we assisted with the initial search of the high school. Um, after that, we assisted with escorting students out of the high school. At some point, were you tasked with securing the residence of 112 East in Oxford? Correct. Okay. And did you go to that address? I did. And tell us what's at that actual address. Was it a condo, a single family home, or something else? A single family home. Okay. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about the layout of the home. Well, first, may I approach? Yes. This is People's Proposed 42. Sir, what have I just handed you? Uh, it looks like a layout of 112 East Street. Okay. And does that uh, correspond with what your actual memory is when you were there at 112 East Street? Correct. Okay. People move to MIT 42. Any objection? No objection. No objection. No objection. Okay. And you can see it's on the, the screen here displayed. Um, you can refer to the exhibit I've handed to you if it's easier for you okay. to know. Uh, tell me, please, what the layout of this uh, residence is. Uh, you walked in. Uh, there was a living room, a small dining room. Um, from there, you'd walk into a kitchen. Uh, right off the kitchen, there was two bedrooms, kind of close in distance. Um, for that, you'd walk into a hallway. There was a washer, dryer machine. Um, and after that, the, fur the furthest west side of the, ho of the house was the master bedroom. Um, and off the master bedroom was a stairwell to the basement. Okay. Now, Detective... I use the word secure. Would that be right? You were there to secure the home? Correct. And now, was that pending issuance of a search warrant? Correct. And was the search warrant actually um, obtained to search that residence? It was. When it was obtained, did you participate in the search? I did. Now, is a residence typically secured prior to the issuance of a search warrant? It is. And tell me why. Uh, to preserve any evidence that may be inside of the residence um, and just to ensure that nobody goes in or inside or outside of the residence that's not supposed to. Okay, so you need to protect the integrity of what's inside the location, is that right? Correct. Okay. And you did that? I did. But nothing's actually searched prior to the search warrant, am I right? Correct. Okay. Now, in your preliminary um, securing of the residence, did you observe anything in plain view? Anything of note? Yes, I did. Okay, tell me what you saw. Uh, inside of the master bedroom, there was a open handgun box on the bed. Um, next to the handgun box, there was a empty box of nine millimeter ammunition on the bed as well. May I first witness? Yes. This is People's Proposed 43. Sir, this is a photograph. What is that photograph of? That's of the uh, handgun box and the empty box of ammunition that was on the bed. Okay. Does that photograph fairly accurately depict what you observed November 30, 2021? It does. People moved to MIT 43. 
Any objections? No objections, Your Honor. Okay. So is this the photograph that you have in your hand right now that I'm displayed on the screen? Yes. Okay. So this, this case that's open, what did you describe that as? A uh, handgun, handgun case. Okay. Now, is that um, a plastic case? Yes. Now, there's clasps, clasps on there to close it, am I right? Correct. Okay. Is there any other locking mechanism on there? Nothing that I observed, no. Okay. And what's the red box next to it? Uh, it was an empty box of uh, nine millimeter ammunition. Did you see either James or Jennifer Crumbly while you were there on scene? I did. Did you see both of them? I did. Can you please point them today and describe something they're wearing today? Uh, James is wearing the orange jumpsuit. Jennifer's wearing the black and white jumpsuit. You under, would record reflect identification of both defendants? Any objections? No objections. No objections. No objection. Now, at some point in time, were you given a code for a um, gun case that did lock? I was. Okay. And who provided that information? James Crumley did. And what was the actual code? What was the number? Uh, zero, zero, zero. So once the, the warrant was officially authorized, you participated in the search as well? Correct. Right. Now, I want to start back at that same bedroom where you made this observation here in 43. Any first one, sir? Yes. Sir, I'm going to hand you a couple of ones. is people suppose 46, 47, and 48. 46 is on top. Okay. All photographs. All photographs, thank you. Uh, starting with 46, sir, what have I handed you? 46 looks like it's the dresser in the master bedroom. The is that the same it. bedroom where you made this observation <coughs> with the open gun case and ammo box? Yes. Okay. And is that photograph? Actually, take a look at all 46, 47, 48. Tell me if those photographs fairly and accurately depict what you observed on November 30, 2021. They do. People moved them at 46, 47, 48. Any objections? No, Your Honor. No objections. Okay, thank you. Starting first with 46. Now, you said this is the same bedroom where you found the empty gun case? Correct. Okay. And um, we're looking at a TV with a um, dresser drawers? Yes. Now, do any of these drawers themselves lock? Not that I saw, no. Okay. And did you have occasion to open up the um, far right drawer? Yes. Okay. Was this photograph here, this is 47. Does this depict what you observed when you opened that up? Yes. Okay. And what are we looking at here? It's a handheld gun safe. And on the top of it, I see some kind of dial. What is that? That's the uh, combination for the lock. Okay. And did you use 000? Yes. And did it open? It did. And when you opened it, um, this is 48 here. What did you find? Uh, it was a 22 Derringer and a 22 uh, caliber Keltec handgun. Okay. And the Keltec, that's a semi automatic handgun? Correct. Okay. And what's the Derringer? I believe that's a single shot um, handgun. When you said the 22, that was, uh, or the Keltec, that was 22 caliber? Correct. Did you also have occasion to look in the kitchen of the home? I did. May I approach my This is people's proposed 50. So that's a photograph. Do you recognize that photograph? I do. And how do you recognize it? That's the uh, kitchen at 112 East Street. Okay. And does that photograph fairly accurately depict what you observed that day? It does. Those are also photographs? Correct. And those photographs also fairly and accurately depict what you observed that day? Correct. People moved to admit 50, 51, and 53. Any objection? No objection. No objection. Okay. Now, this is 50. This is a, a photograph of the kitchen? Correct. Okay. And so what are we looking at here? Uh, just uh, looks like the kitchen with the oven. There's an island um, right across from the sink. Um, 
and some cabinets underneath the island. How would you describe the, the general state of the home? It was messy. Okay. Um, what's this bottle we're looking at right next to the kitchen stove? I can't even see that. Right That's on 50. Appears to be a alcohol, bottle of alcohol or liquor. Was that the only one found? Uh, no, there was, there was multiple uh, bottles of liquor and alcohol throughout the kitchen. Okay, so we're looking at the kitchen island to the left of the screen here. Did you look in that kitchen island? I did. Okay, this is exhibit 51. Is this inside the kitchen island? It is. And what's this black case that we're looking at? It's a Caltech handgun box. Okay. And did you have occasion to open that up? I did. And the Caltech, that's the firearm that you found in the locked gun um, container, correct? Correct. Okay. Now here's 53. Is that a photograph of what that black Caltech gun case looked like when open? Yes. Okay. And then what's inside here? That was a, appeared to be a trigger lock, cable lock of some kind. A cable lock? Yeah. And that's still in its packaging? Correct. Now, throughout the search of the home, did you find any cable locks that were broken or tampered with? No. Did you find any cable locks that were not contained in their original packaging? No. We have one moment, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So first we're going to start, when you first went into the home, um, one of the first exhibits that the prosecution showed you was the empty gun box. Do you recall that? Yes. Okay. And you spoke with James Crumbly when you entered the Crumbly house, is that correct? I spoke with him briefly prior to entering the house. And he told you where his firearms were located? Correct. Okay. And he directed you where to go? Correct. And they were all in his bedroom? Correct. Okay. Now, the Caltech that you said there was a Caltech box found in the kitchen. We just saw that. It's empty, right? Correct. And you located a Caltech firearm, 22 caliber firearm, in the safe, right? Yes. And it was unloaded, correct? It was unloaded. With the Caltech was also a Derringer handgun. Mm -hmm. Correct. And that was also unloaded. Correct. In the safe. Correct. And then there was an, another empty gun box that you found on the bed. Correct. Now, is it your understanding that James Crumbly had placed that on the bed after he'd located it? I can't answer that. I don't know. But the handgun, the empty handgun box and the ammunition were both placed on the bed. They weren't strewn on the bed. Is that fair? They were, they were seated on the bed. I don't know how they got there or, no, they were seated on the bed. I'm going to look for the photograph. Oh, you have um, I believe it is 43, exhibit 43. Uh -huh. Yes. So looking at exhibit 43, they're kind of next to each other on the bed, right? Correct. The bed isn't made, but the, the boxes are seated next to each other. Is that fair? That's fair. Okay. And there was a question in exhibit 48, I believe, about the cable lock in that box. Correct? Mm. Correct. And the prosecutor asked you if you'd located any other cable locks, right? Correct. Um, you didn't. I did not. Uh, that, you have no information to indicate that there was not a second cable lock that was used to secure the Sig Sauer handgun that belonged in that empty hand box. Is that fair? Yeah, I personally did not recover any other locks that day or cable locks that day. You didn't find any other locks and wrappings that weren't being used. Is that fair? Fair. You didn't find any that had been cut off in the, on the premises? I did not, no. And to your knowledge, a cable lock could have been taken with whoever took that handgun out of the box. Is that fair? 
I don't think I can answer that question. You have no knowledge? I have no knowledge, no. And also, just to make very clear, all of the firearms, the Keltac, the Derringer, and the Sig Sauer handgun, obviously the Sig Sauer handgun is not in the, was not in the home at the time. The other firearms were all located in James and Jennifer Crumbly's bedroom. Yeah, correct? the two the two twenty two handguns were located in their bedroom, correct. Okay. And the empty Sig Sauer box was also in their bedroom. Correct. Okay. And you have no reason to believe that that Sig Sauer had been stored anywhere other than in the bedroom. Is that fair? It's actually speculation, Judge. You haven't testified. You can't possibly testify. S One moment, Your Honor. No further questions. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, any questions that we get to just from the Um, thank you. We, when you came into the house um, and saw the Sig Sauer case and the ammunition box on the bed, you have no idea when the box was placed there or when the ammunition box was placed there. Is that correct? Correct. And when you came into the house um, and found those items there, did you ask James and Jennifer when those items were placed there? I did not. Did you listen to or are you familiar with James's 911 call uh, when he reported the missing gun? No, I never listened to that. I have nothing further. Thank you. Any redress? Just very briefly. Sir, the, the Caltech and the Derringer were both unloaded, is that correct? Correct. Where, what, did you find ammunition for those weapons? I don't know. I did not. Okay. Were there bullets? You don't know or you know? No, I did not. I personally did not know. I guess not specific to those firearms. Were there bullets found in that dresser as well? I, I don't recall if there was. Okay. That's fair. Now, how far from the school is 112 East? I'd say around a half mile. Okay. And it's just a straight shot down um, that road, isn't it? Correct. I've got the third. Are you going to step down? Next we'll call Sergeant Teshke. Um, Judge, we have I'm going to take some of these out as well. Would you like me to approach and? Yes,
Producer, can you understand me swearing the testimony you're going to give will be the truth under the penalty of perjury? I do. Please have a seat. Could you please state and spell what the person has named for the record? <coughs> Matthew Peschke, M A T T H E W P E S C H K E. May I proceed, Judge? Sir, what's your occupation? Uh, I am a sergeant with the Oakland County Sheriff's Office. Okay. If you're comfortable, you can remove your mask. Thank you. <clears throat> and you said you're a sergeant with the Sheriff's Office? Yes, sir. How long have you been a police officer? Uh, uh, approximately 20 years. Okay. Now, I want to direct your attention to November the 30th, 2021. Were you working that day? I was. Did you receive notification about a shooting at the Oxford High School? I did. And what did you do? Uh, I went to Oxford High School. Okay, so you responded to the scene? Yes, sir. What did you do while you were there? While I was there, I uh, entered inside. Um, I helped clear the area of any other victims or suspects, did a perimeter search. Okay. Now, at some point, were you um, tasked with responding to 112 East in Oxford? I was. And was asked to secure the scene for a search warrant? Yes. Now, did you go alone with other or with other deputies? I went with other deputies. Was anybody home when you arrived? Yes. Who was that? Uh, Jennifer and James Crumblett. Okay. Did you have? Did you see them when you pulled up? Uh, I did. Yes. Tell me about that, please. Uh, when I pulled up, there was um, another uh, or um, another detective that was on scene. Jennifer was on a porch, and James was in the back. They were having him come out. Okay. Now, <clears throat> at some point, was a search warrant obtained to search the premises? There was. And did you participate in the search of that premises once the search warrant was obtained? I did. Okay. And photographs were taken during the search, am I right? Yes. Now, is it true that it is a sheriff's office policy not to take a photograph, um, and, well, not to disturb the scene until a photograph is taken? I don't, I don't, can't say I've ever read that in a policy. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, when a photograph is taken, uh, of let's say a room, um, is that photograph taken to capture the uh, the way the room actually looked, or is it captured to, to show what the room looked like after it was gone through by the officers? Uh, uh, what it looked like before. Okay. Uh, what was the general condition of the home? Uh, it was an older home. He walked into the living room. It um, seemed fine. Uh, then you went through the kitchen. Um, the bedrooms were a little messy, uh, particularly the, the uh, Ethan's rooms were, were pretty messy. At some point, were, were you made aware which rooms were Ethan Crumbly's? I was. Okay. May I approach one? Yes. I'm going to approach with a few at once. Exhibits 59, 60, 61, 64, 65, 66, and 67. Sir, just take a second. Look through these. 59 is on top. Tell me if those photographs fairly and accurately depict what you observed from 112 East on November the 30th, 2021. People move to admit those exhibits, Judge. 
Any objection? Any objection? Any objection? Any Thank you. All right, sir, I'm going to start with 59. I'm going to have it up here on the screen as well. If it's easier, you can refer to the exhibit in front of you. Okay, this is exhibit 59. What are we looking at here? Uh, that's the northwest bedroom. Was it identified to you whose bedroom this was? It was identified as Ethan's. Okay. In fact, did you were you made aware that there were two bedrooms attributed to Ethan Crumley? Yes. Okay, so this is one of them? Yes. Okay. Now, was this photograph taken before anybody from the sheriff's office went through it, or is this the way it looked? This was before. Okay. So this is the way it looked. All right. Um, and what do we see on the wall here? Uh, those are silhouettes. Okay. Or the, this is uh, 60 here. Is it the same silhouettes? Yes. When we say silhouettes, are we talking about? Uh, gun range. Gun range. Targets? Okay. Now, here's... Um, 61. What do we see here? Uh, that is a empty bottle of whiskey. Okay. Was that the same brand whiskey found throughout the house? It was. There was a, a bottle of it on the kitchen counter. Empty or full? It was... Sorry? Empty or full, I said. I believe it was almost empty. Okay. And this is, again, is in Ethan Crumley's room? Yes. All right. So that's 61. We have 64. And this is still in Ethan Crumley's bedroom, correct? Yeah, this is the nightstand. Okay, this is the nightstand next to the bed? Yes. And so what's depicted in this photograph? Uh, there was miscellaneous shell casings found within the dish. What's a shell casing? It's a um, fired shell casing when a bullet's fired from a gun. It, if it's a semi-automatic, it ejects a shell casing. Okay. Those aren't pretend. Those are real shell casings, right? They appear to be real, yes. Okay. Now, this is uh, 65. What are we looking at here? That was a coin that was found in, in like underneath that dish on that plate. It was a, it had a, a Nazi symbol on it. Okay, and that was on his nightstand in his room? Yes. Ethan Crumbly's? Okay, that's 65, and this is 66. What's this? That's just the other side of it. Okay. Did you put that in that plastic bag, or was it like that? That's how it was. Now this is 67, is this the same bedroom? It is, yes. Okay, and uh, did you find anything of note on that tall dresser to the left? Um, yeah, there was like like animal, like mice, mouse species and things on it like that. On that dresser? Yeah. Yes. Now, did you also search the other bedroom that was identified belonging to Ethan Crumley? Yes. Second, go through those and let me know if they fairly and accurately depict what you observed on November 30th, 2021. They do. People move to admit those exhibits, Judge. Any objection on behalf of Jennifer Crumbly? Um, no objection. Okay. Any objection on behalf of Jennifer Crumbly? Any objection? Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, um, 69, tell us what's in there. Uh, this was the, the other bedroom, the northeast bedroom. Again, does that photograph depict what the room looked like prior to searching or after searching it? Prior. Okay. Did you find a notebook in that on that bed? Uh, the notebook was located by Detective Steele. Okay. It was found in that room, though? Yes. Okay, and it was open? Yes, I believe it was a green notebook. Green notebook, okay. And this photograph here um, in Exhibit 71, what does it depict? It depicts the the open notebook. Okay, so these appear to be drawings. Yes. And what are the drawings of? Uh, I can see that one is a of a like a rifle style gun. Uh, it looks like there's another handgun on there with an extended magazine, possibly. Uh, that's really all I can make out. Okay. Now, were there any weapons found in that room? 
Uh, there were some folding knives. Okay. The next exhibit you have here? Yes. And um, this uh, is exhibit 73. There was a shelf on the wall. There was a shelf on the wall in this bedroom? Yes. Okay, so what are we looking at here in this photograph? Uh, it's a couple folding knives. Okay. And those are real knives, correct? They appear to be real, yes. Okay. The shelf wasn't, wasn't closed off, it was open like this? Yes. Okay. Now, did you search other parts of the home? Uh, I walked through the rest of the home. Uh, at this point, I, I went into the kitchen and started doing a tabulation. Did you, does that home have a basement? It did. Right. Does it have a shed? It did have a shed. How close to the home is the shed? Oh. It's on the property, right? It's on the property, okay. yes. Okay, this, this property doesn't have acres or anything, am I right? No. Okay, so this is a home in, in, in the township of Oxford? Yes. Okay, so we're talk, are we talking a matter of feet from the uh, home to the shed? Yeah. Could you put a, a estimation on it? Yeah, I wouldn't say any more than 50 feet. 50 feet at the most? Yeah. Did you look in the basement as well? I did. And describe the general, I guess, cleanliness of the basement compared to the rest of the home. Uh, basement had a, a couple rooms to it. Uh, as you walk down the stairs, there's a kitty litter box at the bottom of the stairs. It was full. You walk through, and in you know, the basement, uh, there was um, appeared to be a couple rooms that were made with like plastic um, draped down. Uh, it was possibly like an old. Objection, Your Honor. Relevance as to what it could be. Speculation. I'm going to sustain this to speculation. I can lay a foundation, Judge. Sir, you've been a police officer for how long? Um, over 20 years. Okay. In part of those 20 years, have you had the opportunity to participate in search warrant execution? I have. Did you have the opportunity to investigate any drug cases in the past? Yes. Have you had the opportunity to um, investigate and find what you've, what you've discovered to be marijuana grow operations? Uh, Yes. Okay. And you know what marijuana looks like? Yes. You know what it smells like? Yes. Okay. Um, did you find anything in the basement to, as an officer, to give you a um, note regarding marijuana? Objection, Your Honor. Relevance as to any of whether or not there was a marijuana grow operation or not in the basement. That has no bearing on the case. Judge, I can lay an offer of proof for the court. Again, both defendants are charged with willfully neglecting their responsibilities. The failure to do that in part is uh, or doing that in part is their failure to exercise ordinary care. This officer will testify that there was an unsecured marijuana grow operation. And I'm not trying to make a bigger uh, term out of it than what it is. It's just labeled a marijuana grow operation. He's going to testify there was some uh, marijuana found there. It was not in a locked room. It was covered only by a tarp. I'm going to sustain the objection. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. And, sir, you said you, you uh, compiled the tabulation from the search warrant? I did. Okay, thank you. May I have one moment, Your Honor? No. So if I told you that was chinchilla poop from an old pet, would that surprise you? No. Okay. And um, so the bits and pieces that you found in the room, um, it looked like feces from a small animal. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, the coin that you found that was uh, wrapped in plastic, it's fair to say it was wrapped in plastic like a collector's item would be. Is that correct? Yes. And Ethan actually had many, many coins that were wrapped in plastic all about his room. Is that correct? Uh, I can't comment on that. I didn't. I don't. I don't remember seeing any other coins. Okay. So, but that one was wrapped like a collector coin. It was. Okay. Thank you. I have no further questions. Any uh, questions of the James Quimley? No, Your Honor. Any redirects? No, Judge. Thank you. You may step down. Thank you, Judge. Can I call you next witness? You can call the town boss.
laptop's okay. We think that we may have worn out the projector. But we don't have anything else to present. So. record and people this is I didn't know. Lieutenant Timothy Willis, T I M O T H Y W I L L I S. May I proceed? Okay. Sir, how are you employed? I'm employed by the Oakland County Sheriff's Office. And how long have you been a member of the Oakland County Sheriff's Office? Um, over 25 years. Okay, what's your current role there? Uh, I'm the detective lieutenant assigned to the Investigative Forensic Services Division. Okay, and tell me, sir, what does a detective lieutenant at the um, Investigative Services Division do? Uh, I oversee our Special Investigations Unit, our Fugitive Apprehension Team, Computer Crimes, and our Warrants Division. Okay, and what's, what are some of the previous assignments you've had? I've been a lieutenant since uh, 2016. Uh, prior to this assignment, I was a road patrol lieutenant in Rochester Hills. Prior to that, I was a detective, uh, a sergeant for 10 years, and I did five years as a detective sergeant in the Special Investigations Unit. Okay. Now, would it be fair to, to refer to you as one of the officers in charge of the investigation in the case of People versus James and Jennifer Crumbly? Yes. And also the case of People versus Ethan Crumbly? Yes. Okay. Uh, now, I say one of the officers in, in charge because this is a very large investigation, is that right? Correct. So you work as a part of a team? Yes, sir. Generally speaking, what does an officer in charge do? Generally speaking, we, we direct the investigation. Okay. Now, have you had the opportunity to review um, the narrative reports generated in this case? Yes. Have you been made aware of the 911 calls made in regards to the November 30, 2021 Oxford School shooting? Yes. Now, first of all, I want to ask you, you, as officer in charge, you sat through the hearing today as well as February the 8th, is that right? Correct. And um, you were present when we um, admitted Exhibit 10, which would be text messages between Ethan Crumbly and Jennifer Crumbly, and specific the last, last text message that said, Ethan, don't do it. You were here for that? Yes. Okay. And um, you, do you recall the time on that text message? 122. Okay, 122 yeah. in the afternoon. And what time did James Crumbly call 911, if you recall? 134 p.m. Okay. And tell us, sir, if you know approximately what time did the actual shooting begin? 1251. Okay. And do you know the time the shooting actually stopped? 1258. Okay. Now, <clears throat> at 122 p.m., had the shooter's name been made public? No. At 1.34 p.m., had the shooter's name been made public? No. How many 911 calls were made 
on November the 30th, 2021, regarding the Oxford High School shooting? Over 100. Out of those over 100 phone calls, how many of them identify their own son as the possible shooter? But just one, James Crumbly. James Crumbly. Now, sir, you were here when um, Sean Hopkins testified, correct? Yes. Okay. And you heard testimony from Mr. Hopkins that James Crumbly asked Ethan Crumbly about his journal. Yes. And you were here during the cross-examination of Mr. Hopkins when he was asked more questions by defense counsel about that journal. Yes. Have you had the opportunity to read the journal? I have. Well, first, let me, let me back up. Were you made aware that a journal was found with Ethan Crumbly's belongings on November the 30th, 2021? Yes, I was. And where was it found? It was found in the bathroom that the video showed Ethan went in um, just prior to the incident. Okay. He entered with, the, with his backpack. He exited without his backpack. The backpack was found in the bathroom with his journal. Were you able, when you read the journal, were you able to identify it as being written by Ethan Crumbly? I was. How so? Uh, well, his name was all over it, and it, uh, his, the, the way his handwriting was, was very similar. In fact, the way that he makes his Ds are, are very unique. It's almost like a number two. Uh, he re references the, uh, the bird head incident. His, his, he references his best friend that we know. Um, we've come to know who that is. So it's not just from the handwriting or from the location, but also from the content as well? Correct. Is that fair? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, could you describe what the actual journal looks like? Yeah, it's a hardbound black uh, journal with apartments.com imprinted on the front of it. Okay. Now, was there writing throughout the entire, entire journal? The writing st starts about three quarters of the way into the journal, and then it fills up the rest of the book. Now, from reviewing it, are you able to tell if the, the first written page on there, closest to the front, if that was the first entry in the journal or the last entry in the journal? The last, the last entry of the and journal. And how are you able to make that distinction? Based on the date that was written in it of 11-29-21. Okay. And if you were to, let's say, make a photocopy of just the written pages of the journal, how many pages would it be? 21. Out of those 21 pages, how many discussed the Oxford High School shooting or his plan to shoot up Oxford High School? Every single page. Every single page. Every single page. Now, is this journal all in written format or drawings contained as well? No, both. Both written and drawings. Okay. <clears throat> now, because this is a preliminary examination, I'm just going to ask you about a few uh, pages here. Now, we talked about the first written page and how it said, well, first of all, it being 21 pages long, if I showed you a photocopy of it, would that refresh your recollection when we talk about it? Yes, that'd be helpful. Thank you. May I approach witness? Yes. And sir, just for identification purposes, what have I handed you? Uh, this is a, a photocopy of uh, the journal um, that we found, that Ethan's journal found in the bathroom. Okay. So what we have here labeled as page one, that's not an actual written page, correct? What is that of? No, that was the inside cover of the of the book. It's you know just start states at the top property of Ethan Crumbly. Okay, so just so we're all clear, page number two is the actual first writing, first page written in the journal, closest to the front of the journal. Is that right? That is correct. Okay, and you testify this appears to be the actual last entry of the journal. It appears to be yes. And is this where it has the date on there? It does. Okay, what else is on there? It has it at the very bottom. Um, in big bold letters, the words "forgive me." Okay. If you were to flip the page, what did you see there of note? Um, toward the bottom half of the page, it says, first off, I got my gun. It's a SP twenty twenty two six hour nine millimeter." See, second, the shooting is tomorrow. I have access to the gun and ammo. Okay. Now, you said there's drawings in there as well? Yes. Okay. Now, again, I'm not going to go through every single page here. I'm going to direct you what's been labeled as page 15. Um, as far as drawings are concerned, what do you see here? It a, it's, appears to be drawings of two uh, separate bullets. 
Um, one's labeled a 22, the other one's labeled a 9 millimeter. The 22 next to it has kill range 25 M max, um, and the 9 millimeter has kill range 100 M. Okay, if you were to flip the page to page 16. Is there a drawing on that page as well? There is. The bottom half of the page, uh, a large drawing of a, what appears to be a cup um, with liquid in it, a severed bird head, uh, and a, what I can only describe as a demon standing drawn next to it. Okay. Now, is this a little drawing or is it a bigger drawing? It takes up the bottom quarter of the page. It's a large drawing. Now, if, what about on page 18? What do you see on that page with regards to drawings? From the drawing, it appears it's it's the drawing of a head with where the eye is uh, an X. Uh, the head appears to have a ponytail, and then a gun extended, a semi-automatic -auto handgun extended out, um, with a round being fired into the the back of the person's head. Okay. Is there any context to that drawing? Any just, written context? Just above it, it says the first victim has to be to be pretty girl with a future so she can suffer like me. And you said that drawing of the gun it depicted a semi-automatic handgun? Correct. And earlier you, you referenced the passage where he says, I have access to the gun and ammo. It's an SP-2022 six hour? Yes, sir. Is that, what is SP-2000, I'm sorry, SP-2022, what is that? That is the model number of the weapon used in the shooting. And is that a semi-automatic handgun? It is. Okay. Now, Are some, if you flip through the journal, are some passages written with larger letters, bolded letters? Yes. Okay. If you were to flip the page to page 19, what do you see there? The, in the middle of the page, in all caps, I will kill everyone I fucking see. Is there any context made to that statement? Uh, just above it, it says, I will cause the biggest school shooting in Michigan's history. Um, and then he, then he goes on to say, I will kill everyone I fucking see. I have fully mentally lost it after years of fighting with my dark side. My parents won't listen to me about help or a therapist. Okay. I want to refer you back to page six now. Six. Let me talk about some bolded letters. And this isn't just a few pages, right? It's throughout the journal. Is that fair to say, the bolded letters? Yes, sir. Okay. On page six, does anything jump out at you? Uh, the world, the word help in bold letters colored in. Is there any context to that word? Yeah. In that, um, right next to help, it says, I have zero help for my mental problems, and it's causing me to shoot up the fucking school. I have one moment here. I have nothing further. Any questions that we have for Dr. Conte? Uh, yes, sir. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, you just testified about the journal um, that was found in Ethan's backpack, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And you testified it was approximately, um, how many pages? 20? 20, 20, 20, 21. Uh, 21, 21, 21 pages. written pages. Okay, and I'm holding up what I believe is a copy of it. Does this look close to what you have? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Now, um, throughout this journal, um, you testified that you can see it's Ethan Crumbly's writing in the journal, um, and you can tell it's his writing based on the way he shapes letters, correct? Yes. It's fair to say that the only person who you can identify having written in this journal is Ethan Crumbly. Y yes. There are no messages written in the journal, like, to Ethan, from mom, you know, anything like that. No. There's no messages in there like from James saying, Ethan, I want you to do whatever after school. No messages like that. No writing from James or Jennifer Crumbly to Ethan. No. So as far as you can tell, this uh, journal that 
has been called Ethan's journal was Ethan's possession. Is that correct? I'm sorry, ma'am. Can you repeat I that, please? That's just a speculation. He can testify to what the writing's consistent of, but as far as possession, the court knows that's a, a legal concept, Judge. He can only testify to what he reviewed. And I think she missed her price, too, also. Okay. Um, the journal... The journal that was found is believed to be Ethan Crumbly's journal, correct? Yes, ma'am. And on the front, it, it actually says property of Ethan Crumbly, correct? Written, yes. Okay. And in the journal, um, in addition to writing about school shootings um, and other issues, um, there's also a a continuous message of, I love you, mom, I love you, dad, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Is that correct? A continuous message? Well, it, uh, let's start with page uh, 775. Okay. We see there that he writes, uh, yeah? I don't have 775. Maybe. The one that has forgive me at the bottom. Okay. Okay, so, Above the um, forgive me at the bottom and above the last passage that's written, um, it says, I'm sorry for this, Mom and Dad. I'm not trying to hurt you by doing this. I have to do this. Do you see that? I don't, miss. I'm sorry. May I approach? Yeah. It starts. Uh, right in here it starts and then it continues oh okay, okay okay I'm sorry so, there's, so in that first part we see there's a message there that says um, I'm sorry for this mom and dad I'm not trying to hurt you by doing this I have to do this do you see that yes and that's in Ethan's handwriting correct yes it appears okay. to be and then below that, there's a paragraph that's indented just a bit. And again, it says, I love you, Mom. I love you, Dad. I'm sorry for never saying it back. Um, and then I love you to pets. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Okay. And then going a couple pages into um, the journal, I guess let's go towards the back, um, the second to last page. There's a little, uh, it would be page 21 on what the prosecutor gave me, page 794 of what I have. Um, on the bottom left-hand corner, um, you can see where he writes, I hope my parents can forgive me for what I do. Do yes. you see that? Yes, I do. And in this journal, um, it's fair to say that there is nothing that indicates Jennifer and James know what Ethan is going to do in terms of the school shooting. Uh, repeat it, please. I'm sorry, ma'am. There is no evidence in this journal that shows Ethan told his mom and dad what he planned to do in terms of that school shooting. No, ma'am. And if anything, his messages about his parents um, are more so ones of, I love you and please forgive me. Yes, in the journal, seen, yes. From what you've seen. Yes. On the last page of the journal, um, so it would be page 22 on what you have, and it's page 795 on what I have. I want to draw your attention to the left side of the um, page. There's writing written up the side. Do you see where it reads, I will have to find where my dad hid my 9mm before I can shoot the school? Yes. Um, now, closer to the front of the journal, um, Ethan mentions that... At, at another point in time, um, he has access to the gun and the ammo, correct? Yes, I believe that's, what, three? Page three? Um, on mine, it's page 776. On yours, it's page, yes, three. Okay. 
Okay, so on, on that page he writes, uh, the shooting is tomorrow, I have access to the gun and the ammo, correct? Yes. And it does not say in this how he has access to the gun or how he gained access to the gun, correct? It does not say that. It does not say how he has access to the ammo or how he gained access to the ammo. You're correct. And so from reading his journal, even knowing he had access to the gun, you cannot say that Jennifer or James Crumbly gave Ethan access to the gun. By reading this journal, you're correct. There is no way to draw conclusions about what Ethan did to gain that access, correct? Section of the form of the question, Judge. Conclusions are for the court. I, I believe the witness was already answering. I, I don't think it was confusing. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm going to overrule the objection. I'm not being, the question of whether it was confusing to the witness and he did respond. Go ahead. Thank you. Now, this journal also, um, just so we can be clear, was found in Ethan's backpack, correct? Yes. And when I say backpack, I'm talking about the bag he used at school um, that he had the last day he attended Oxford High School, the day of the school shooting, correct? Yeah. Yes. And this journal was found in the backpack um, where the gun was also located. No. Well, the gun was located there at some point in time prior to the shooting. Is that correct? I, I don't know what you mean, ma'am. The gun was I'm sorry, I, I, you know what, I'm asking a really bad question. Let me back up. Um, the backpack had certain items uh, that remained in it. Um, the backpack was found in a bathroom by law enforcement, is that correct? Yes. And in the backpack um, that belonged to Ethan, that is where his journal was found, is that correct? Yes. When you found the journal in the backpack, you have no other knowledge of where that journal had been other than in Ethan's backpack, correct? I have no, I'm sorry, miss. Can you repeat that, please? You don't, so for example, you can't say this journal was on the kitchen counter at home where someone would have seen it. This journal would have been here or there. All you know is that that journal, the last, when you saw it, was in Ethan's backpack. Correct? Yes, yes. Your Honor, may I have just a moment? to tell um, chronologically how the um, how the journal was written, correct? You mean when it was written? Yeah, like what, were you able to tell that Ethan wrote some passages and then wrote passages later in time? It, it appears that way by the way the, the journal's written, yes. Do you agree with me that the um, the statement about I need to find where my dad hid the gun, that statement comes before Ethan saying he now has access to the gun? Judge, I have to perform the question. I don't think it's anything. The, the last page of the journal talking about, I will have to find where my dad hid my nine millimeter before I can shoot the school. This writing was written prior to the writings at the top of the pile on the journal pages. Was that a question, ma'am? Yeah. Okay. Does so that sound correct to you? Yes, I I mean, I can't say for sure this is a margin writing. It doesn't seem to be, but I, I don't know. I don't you know. have no reason to, to disagree, though. Is that correct? It's 
speculation. We can't answer it. Can't answer. Okay. Okay. I have nothing further. Any uh, questions that we have of Jake's comment? None, Yara. Any read your eyes? Just very briefly. Sir, you said on the whole 21 pages here, every single page references the school shooting? It does. Okay. And if you were to just flip through quickly, we talked about there's some pages with with these bolded letters. I'm going to, this is six with the word help in there. Yes. Okay. And, and that's where he says, I have zero help for my mental problems, and it's Your causing Honor, me to shoot this fucking school. You were asked about the very last page on page 22, and I just want to make sure I heard your testimony correctly. Okay. The, the passage in there was, he had my nine millimeter. Is that correct? That is correct. I will have to find where my dad hid my nine millimeter before I can shoot up the school. And if you were to look at, if you were to look at page three, that's closer to the front of the book, right? Yes. And that's where he writes, first off, I got my gun. It's a SP2022 six hour nine millimeter. Correct. Okay. And then he writes, second, the shooting is tomorrow. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. And the page just before this identifies the date as November 29th of 2021? Yes, sir. And that is actually the gun that he used for the school shooting on November 30th, 2021? The six hour SP2022, yes, nine Thank millimeter. You. I've nothing further. Your Honor, may I briefly uh, recall? Dennis, please, only. Okay. Um, the prosecution brought up the word my in terms of my gun. Um, when you handle cases where a teenager is driving a car, um, there are times when it is owned by their parent, correct? Yes. Even if, is irrelevant. Even if they call it my objection car. Is objection. Objection is irrelevant. Um, the prosecution is trying to make my mean that it's absolute possession when it's very obvious that my gun is technically his parents' gun. It does not mean it's his gun that he has free access to. The prosecution has been tainting the whole hearing. Well, all he would do is testify as to what was actually in the journal itself and the language that was in the journal. Right. So and that's what he testified to. And I'm just asking him that in circumstances when a writing says my something and a teenager has written it, sometimes they're referring to well, property. Well, you are asking him to speculate at that point because you're asking him to get into the head of some of the teenagers Okay, I have nothing further. Thank you. Nothing further. You may step down and call your next witness. All right, the people rest. Any defense witnesses? No, Your Honor. Okay, I'm going to take about five minutes and we'll come back for uh, the argument on the motion. Thank you, Judge.
are back on the record of People versus Crumbly. Uh, both parties have rested with their witnesses for purposes of preliminary examination. Is the prosecutor ready for the motion? Yes, ma'am. Judge, we spent two days and over 12 hours listening to witnesses testify, lawyers arguing, and re reviewing evidence. Before I begin, though, this afternoon, I want to first talk about four people that we haven't mentioned by name. They are Hannah St. Juliana. She was 14 when she was killed from a gunshot to her back, abdomen, forearm, and thighs. Tate Muir, he was 16 when he was killed from a gunshot wound to his head. Justin Schilling, he was 17 when he was killed from a gunshot wound to his head. And Madison Baldwin, who was 17 when she was killed from a gunshot wound to her head. This exam is as much about them as it is the defendant's guilt. Your Honor, you are an experienced jurist and I know that you know the burden that I have today. But for the record, my burden is to show that there's probable cause to believe a felony was committed and that James and Jennifer Crumbly committed it. Each defendant has been charged with four counts of involuntary man manslaughter, and this court knows this is defined in Michigan by an unintentional killing without malice. There are two ways we will show and have shown that the defendants are guilty of involuntary manslaughter according to Michigan law. One is a gross negligence in the performance of a lawful act. The second is gross negligence in the failure to perform a legal duty. Your Honor, both Jennifer and James Crumbly were grossly negligent when they failed to perform their legal duty as a parent. As parents, we have a legal duty to exercise reasonable care to prevent others and the community and third parties from our child hurting someone else. As parents, we all know this, but it's also well settled in Michigan law. They are also grossly negligent in the storing and securing and buying of a firearm. Gross negligence is defined as a willful neglect and disregard to the results and a failure to use ordinary care to prevent an apparent result. And for both of those theories, Your Honor, we are required to look at what each defendant knew. So let's talk about that. Both Jennifer and James Crumbly knew the evidence showed that their son was experiencing disturbing mental health issues in the months leading up to the shooting. He texted his mother, Jennifer, in the March before. March 9th, 2021, 7.50 p.m. Ethan says, can you get home now? No response. 7.50 seconds later, there is someone in the house, I think. No response. 7.50 seconds later, someone walked into the bathroom and flushed the toilet and left the light on. No response. And I thought it was you, but when I came out, no one was home. No response. There is no one in the house, though. No response. That was at 7.51. At 8 o'clock, dude, my door just slammed. No response. Maybe it's just my paranoia at 8.01. Seconds later, but when are you going to get home? You Honor, based on the testimony of Detective Wagrowski, we know that there was no response. There was no call. And the, and the next communication we see is the following day and Jennifer Crumley texts her son, where's your, where's your dad? We also know that on March 16th, that same month, 3.18 p.m., okay, the house is now haunted. No response. That's at 6.03. Seconds later, some weird shit just happens, and now I'm scared. No response. Seconds later, I got some videos. No response, 603, and a picture of a demon. No response. It is throwing bowls. No response. I'm not joking, it fucked up the kitchen. No response. I'm just going to be outside for a while. 
629, can you at least text back? No response. We know from the testimony where James and Jennifer were, they were at the stable taking pictures of their, themselves on horses. We also know that they had evidence that they were, that they were told based on the comments in the journal that was just uh, testified to by Detective Tim Willis. And perhaps the most chilling, from the words of their son, a day before he murdered four people, I have zero help in my mental problems, and it's causing me to shoot the school. My parents won't listen to me. According to his journal, he told his dad he needed help. I'm sorry, according to the text message that he, to his friend, he told his dad he needed help, and Jane his dad told him to suck it up. We know from texts between both defendants that he had a rough night sometime in March, so much so that he didn't know where or how he woke up or how he got there. Both defendants knew he wanted a gun. Both defendants knew he was obsessed with violent content. There was a picture of a target, too, we saw today on his bedroom wall. He's 15 years old. He's got nothing on his walls except two targets with bullet holes in them. We know that the defendants purchased, James Crumbly purchased that gun for him, and that mom then posted somewhat bragging about it in her Instagram post. so I'll just read it. November 27th, 2021. Mom and Sunday testing out his new Xmas present. My first time shooting a 9mm, I hit the bullseye. There's a picture of the target. Apparently mom's boasting about her skill in firearms, a picture of the gun, and a, Christmas of, a picture of a Christmas tree. We know that mom took him shooting based on that text and based on the evidence that came in today in the testimony. We know that on the day of, the day before the shooting, Jennifer Crumbly received a voicemail from Pam Fine, alerting her that her son was scrolling through the phone and, and searching ammunition. And chillingly, we know that mom, when reporting that to her son that day via text, says to her, says to her son, did you show them a picture of your gun? And then her infamous text, LOL, you have to learn not to get caught. Your Honor, both Jennifer and James Crumbly knew that their son had access to that gun. There is no, not one shred of evidence that that gun was locked. The only locked mechanism in the house you heard today was to lock up two of the guns they had, and the combination was zero, zero, zero. There was no, nothing in the house that indicated there was a cable lock. The only cable lock that was found was in, in its package. They knew that their son was trained. We saw a video of that today. He knew exactly what he was doing. This is not somebody that was new to a firearm. They knew that he was isolated, that he had, was spending hours by himself at home. And how do we know that, Your Honor? We know that because Kira testified our first day what kind of hours they spent at the stable. Now, I suppose you could say they're great horse owners, but what you can't say is that they were with their son. Three to four times a week, 
two to three hours a time after work and lots of testimony to say he didn't want to have anything to do with the stable. He was not there with his parents. Jennifer texted James on the day of the 30th, I am very concerned after being shown the math worksheet. James replies, WTF. Both defendants know, knew that Ethan had no friends. He had one friend. And they repeatedly, Jennifer Crumley repeatedly told people. She told people at work. She told Kira. He had no friends except one. And that friend was taken away abruptly in October and sent to some treatment. We know that Jennifer Crumbly said her son was weird and he wasn't normal. And then, Your Honor, we know that on the morning of the 30th, just hours before the shooting, they received the math worksheet. And the math worksheet says, it, first of all, it's a picture drawn of a gun that's identical to the picture of the actual gun they had purchased for him. There are words like, the thoughts won't stop, help me, blood everywhere. We learned from Sean Hopkins that James Crumbly said he knew about that journal. He referenced it to, to his son. Both James and Jennifer Crumbly, the evidence shows, followed their son on Instagram. And the testimony shows what kinds of things he was posting on Instagram, which were disturbing, also a picture of the gun calling it his new baby. Those are all the things we know, the testimony shows that they knew. But let's talk about the things that, through the use of ordinary care, they would have uncovered using ordinary care. If they had looked at the journal, they would have seen that every single page out of 21 pages references a school shooting. They would have read the words, I got my gun, shooting is tomorrow, I have access to the gun and ammo. They would have read, the first victim has to be a pretty girl with the future so she can suffer like me. I'll kill everyone I see. My parents won't listen to me. I have zero help with my mental problems. We heard through Detective Wagrowski and the text messages that their son texted to his friend over and over and over again. I told my parents, I need help. I'm having a mental breakdown. My dad told me to suck it up. My mom thinks I'm on drugs. She laughed at me. I also have to prove that this was foreseeable. We need only look at their own actions that day. Jennifer Crumbly, before the news was public, who this shooter was, at 1.22 p.m. texted her son, Ethan, don't do it. James Crumbly, upon learning there was a school shooting and couldn't get a hold of his son, went to his house and looked for the gun. He didn't go to the mire like all the other parents to try to find his son. He went home to look for the gun. And then on, at 1.34, he called 911 and we listened to his call. Your Honor, you can't argue, you can't even possibly consider that there was, this was not foreseeable when the moment you hear about a school shooter, you go look for the weapon you just bought him and then call 911 and say, I think my son's the school shooter. And Jennifer Crumley's text to her son, Ethan, don't do it before it's ever made public. I also have to prove that the defendants could have done something to prevent this. Let's talk about that. They could have taken him home 
or to get help that day as Sean Hopkins asked them to do. Did they do that? No. Why not? They said they had to go to work. We heard testimony from Jennifer's employer. She absolutely did not have to come back to work. It's a family-friendly environment. They would have understood she did not have to come back to work. This is not a situation where somebody is going to get fired if they don't come back to work. But by the way, most parents wouldn't care about that. They would just take their son. In fact, she came home, or she came back to work, talked to Amanda and said, I guess I'm a failure as a parent. And what did Amanda say? You should probably go get him. She states to Amanda, he can't be alone. James Crumbly was a DoorDash driver. I think the court can take judicial notice that being a DoorDash driver is completely your work hours optional. When you start, optional. When you finish, optional. If you take a break, optional. The fact that they looked at Sean Hopkins in front of their son that day and said, we can't do it, won't work, we have to go to work, it was preventable. They could have gone home to see if the gun was there after they met with the school. They didn't do that. They could have locked the gun and made it completely inaccessible to their son. They did not do that. We have Ethan's own statements saying they didn't do that. And we also have the other big thing, which is that that was the gun he used to murder four people. They could have asked him on that day where the gun was. They could have told the school that they had just purchased a gun for him. They could have looked at them in the backpack and asked if it was there and asked to see the journal. They could have taken him to the doctor. They could have looked at his phone. And what happened as a result, Your Honor? Had they exercised reasonable care to control their son, Hannah, Madison, Tate, and Justin would still be here. This was a direct and natural cause and a result of this gross negligence. Your Honor, my burden is to show there's probable cause to believe this crime was committed. I believe we have shown that today. I also believe that on behalf of the people of the state of Michigan, that it is time for Jennifer and James Crumbly to face a juror of their peers in a criminal trial. And I believe at that trial, they will be found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Thank you. Thank you. Your Honor, the, um, the gravity of the loss, of the losses that took place on uh, November 30th of last year um, cannot even be stated um, in all fairness to the victims in this case. The community is, is hurting. There was a very tragic loss of life. Many were hurt. Families will never be whole. And there is no question that people in the community want accountability to hold someone responsible for the deaths of these young people and the injuries that took place to many more. The law, unfortunately, doesn't work that way. The person who is accountable for this case, Ethan Crumbly, he will be held accountable. And just because it is such a great tragedy does not mean that the law starts to expand into things it's not. And that is what the prosecution is asking you to do. To prove involuntary manslaughter, the prosecution must prove it in, in two ways. First, that the defendant caused the death of the deceased and that the defendants acted in a grossly negligent manner. In looking at what a grossly negligent manner is, the defendant has to know of the danger to the other and know there was a situation that required them to take ordinary care 
to avoid injuring another. And the element that the prosecution in this case can never prove is that Jennifer Crumbly or James Crumbly knew that their son was going to commit a school shooting and shoot people with a gun, shoot anyone with a gun. There is also a way of proving involuntary manslaughter when the defendant had a legal duty to the deceased, to the students who were shot. The defendant knew of the facts that gave rise to that legal duty and that the defendant willfully neglected or refused to perform that duty. There is absolutely no legal duty in this case that Jennifer Crumbly or James Crumbly owed to any other student at Oxford High School. Just because it sounds good to come up with a bunch of things that could have been done or should have been done or would have changed the trajectory of that day does not mean that a legal duty is somehow born and created. When the prosecution argues gross negligence and talks about what the defendants knew or should have known, it's, it's actually not a question about what they should have known. The jury instruction reads that it's about what the defendant, defendants knew, and they had to know that their child was going to commit a school shooting. Out of all the evidence that was presented, there were absolutely no text messages or Facebook messages that showed Jennifer Crumbly was ever given information that her son would commit a school shooting. There was absolutely no evidence that Jennifer Crumbly ever saw the journal that indicated her son was going to commit a school shooting. There was no information that a teenager texting his parents about believing the house was haunted would create any belief that that child was going to go and shoot people in a school shooting. When the Crumbleys had a rough night with their son that was talked about between them the next day, talking about how their son ended up in their bed, there was no way to say that that incident would predict and foreshadow their son would shoot up a school. The prosecution absolutely cannot prove that Jennifer or James Crumbly knew that there would be a school shooting. The prosecution knows this, which is why they have stretched hard to bring in evidence, what looks like evidence, to make these people look like the worst parents in the world. At the end of the day, the law doesn't care about what kind of parents they were. It cares whether they knew their son was going to commit these murders. And Jennifer and James Crumbly did not know that a murder, any murder, would be committed. Jennifer and James would have been horrified had they believed a murder was possible. And the extensive testimony from Sean Hopkins, who is a trained professional that did a risk assessment on Ethan Crumbly, and he did actually have a legal duty to take certain actions that he didn't even think he needed to take. Sean Hopkins, was afraid this child was suicidal, not homicidal, not that he was a threat to anyone other than himself. And so when Jennifer texted Ethan later that day after hearing there was a situation at the school and said, don't do it, it makes perfect sense that she would have believed she was stopping a potential suicide after Sean Hopkins had discussed suicide and suicidal ideation with the parents earlier that day. To suggest that Jennifer said don't do it because she knew her son was going to go into a school and take that gun and shoot students, the evidence does not add up to show that. 
The prosecution is overstating so much of the evidence to suggest that the voicemail Jennifer Crumbly received about Ethan looking up bullets in the school should have made her know he was going to commit these murders is just complete insanity. We all heard the voicemail. The prosecution admitted it as evidence. In that voicemail, Pam Fine says, you know, shooting and going to the gun range is a hobby and you don't even have to call me back unless you have questions. How would any person take that message and believe their child was going to go commit a school shooting? There is just no logic that would connect one dot to the other. Talking about Ethan being at home for periods of time while his parents are out with horses and playing video games and doing things alone, there is nothing to suggest that a child who spends three to four hours at home alone would be expected to go and shoot up a school. That is just not something that a person would logically expect to happen. And any parent this day and age, and I speak as a parent of four children, knows that children get busy with video games, their own things, their own lives, they're online, life is different these days. And to suggest that Ethan being alone would lead the conclusion to the conclusion that he would shoot up a school is absolutely ridiculous, especially after all the alone times our children have spent over these last two years through COVID. The arguments that the parents could have taken him home. They could have looked in the bag. All the could have, would have, should have, wished we had done this is not, how, is, not the, is not how the law works. The prosecution has to prove that there's a legal duty or that the defendants knew this would happen and failed to exercise ordinary care. They absolutely cannot reach that burden um, even by the low standard required for probable cause. Okay. Uh, response on behalf of James Cumberland. Yeah, correct. Good afternoon, Your Honor. I'm going to echo a sentiment by Sean Hopkins, Your Honor. He stated that as a school counselor, he's not a mind reader. And, Your Honor, neither are parents. The prosecution, as Ms. Smith has stated, is arguing that James and Jennifer Crumbly should have known about Ethan's plans to, shoot, to execute the shooting at Oxford High School or that he posed a danger to others. First, Your Honor, as Ms. Smith has stated, that is not the standard. The legal standard is not whether or not James and Jennifer should have known. The jury instruction and the law is that they actually knew. Your Honor, there has not been one witness nor one piece of evidence admitted, no, no piece of testimony presented to this court that indicated that James and Jennifer Crumbly knew that Ethan Crumbly was going to commit a shooting at Oxford High School on any day, including November 30th of 2021. Your Honor, using the should have standard extends this criminal liability so far beyond where we are today. It allows the prosecution to prosecute parents for the actions of their children. An example, Your Honor, two high school students are texting each other about having sex. One of them is under the age of consent. They carry out the act and the parents can be charged assuming that those text messages were sent on, a phone, on phones owned by the parents. Two high school students are taking and sending nude photographs to each other, which as this court knows is a crime, using phones owned by their parents. Using the should have known standard, the parents can be charged for what their children did. Your Honor, the prosecution has presented witnesses who testified about what Ethan Crumbly told other people, not what he told James Crumbly. The comments that he made about his mental health, um, about his mental health deteriorating, about him asking for help from his parents, 
None of those messages were sent to James Crumbly, nor Jennifer Crumbly. They were sent to his friend, as the court noted. There have been no witnesses or evidence presented about a duty that James Crumbly had to any of the students who were tragically killed on November 30th, 30th of 2021. There has been no evidence or witnesses presented, Your Honor, because that duty does not exist. There is no legal duty identified by the prosecution or evidence presented or testimony obtained about a legal duty that James Crumbly owed to any of these students that were killed on November 30th of 2021. Additionally, Your Honor, there, has been, there were no witnesses that testified and no evidence presented that James Crumbly knew that Ethan Crumbly was a threat to anyone, including the students of Oxford High School, or that Ethan would commit the shooting on November 30th of 2021. Your Honor, before we even get to whether or not ordinary care should have been or was used, we can't get past that in order to get to ordinary care, the prosecution has to show, even at their very low burden today, that James and Jennifer Crumley knew. There has not been a single witness or piece of evidence presented to this court that James Crumbly knew that Ethan Crumbly was a danger to anyone other than himself. Sean Hopkins testified that he was very clear that Ethan Crumbly, that he had concerns that Ethan was a danger to himself, that he was having suicidal ideations. And Your Honor, he acknowledged that when he made James and Jennifer Crumbly aware of his concerns, they agreed to get their son counseling. The one danger that they were aware of, Your Honor, they agreed to take care to address. Unfortunately, they never got that opportunity. Your Honor, under the law, we cannot impute knowledge to James or Jennifer Crumbly without evidence that they actually had that knowledge. The prosecution can't argue that they should have known. The prosecution can't argue that there was a journal there were text messages, there were Facebook messages, there were these things, there were those things. They can't assume and speculate that because those things existed, that James or Jennifer Crumbly did in fact have actual knowledge that their son was a danger to anyone. Without evidence that James Crumbly had actual knowledge, the prosecution is merely speculating. And Your Honor, the should have known argument that the prosecution has tried to make by saying that there were all of these things that the parents should have looked at, should have done, should have this, should have that, could have this, could have that. The prosecution is essentially conceding, Judge, that James and Jennifer Crumbly did not have actual knowledge that Ethan Crumbly was a danger to anyone other than himself, including the students at Oxford High School. Your Honor, the prosecution has not met their burden. They haven't met the low standard of probable cause. The prosecution has not even satisfied the very first element of the law in showing that James and Jennifer Crumbly had actual knowledge that their son was a danger to anyone other than himself. Rebuttal. Your Honor, I'm an officer of the court. And as an officer of the court, it's my responsibility to bring cases based on law, facts, and common law and statutes. So let's talk about what this case is built on, not speculation. Number one, whether or not there's a legal duty. Such a duty forming the basis for manslaughter is not a novel proposition as it is contained in the literal handbook on criminal law in this well-respected treatise by Lefebvre and Scott that was published in 1973 and all of us as law students looked at this book, studied this book, and were required to know this book and what was in it. The authors discuss manslaughter based on the duty to act. Honor, in discussing duties, that it's, a, it's my rebuttal. I did not object when she was talking. I can object. A treatise is not the law. If she would let me finish, Your Honor. I know the law is. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. 
In discussing duties that can form the basis for manslaughter charges, they state, a parent not only has a duty to act affirmatively to safeguard his children, but he also has a duty to safeguard third persons from his children. And we know Michigan recognizes this duty as noted in American States Insurance Company versus Elvin, 118 Mishep 201, 1982, and Dortmund v. Lester, 380 Mish 80, 1968. It has been well settled law that there is a duty. Not once did you hear me argue or Mr. Keese argue about what the parents should have known. I didn't say it because that's not my burden. What I said was what the, the use of ordinary care would have uncovered. I do not have to show that they had actual knowledge that their son was gonna shoot up the school. I don't have to prove that he said, I'm gonna shoot up the school. I don't have to prove that he said, I'm gonna go murder four people. I have to prove foreseeability. That's the law. And I have proven that it was foreseeable, Your Honor. And not just because of one fact, and not just because of a meeting at the school or words on a paper, so much more. And so much more than anyone else knew. No one else was in the position to know that that gun was purchased as a Christmas present, that he was, it was accessible, that he had been disturbed, he was having hallucinations, that he was isolated, he had lost all of his friends. Nobody else knew that. Taken all together, it is absolutely foreseeable. They took a disturbed, mentally challenged, and possibly ill kid, their son, and what did they do? They didn't take him to a doctor. They didn't take him home. They didn't walk in that room and say, I love you, I'll do anything for you, what's wrong? They didn't embrace him. You know what they did? They bought him a weapon. They bought him a deadly weapon, and then at the moment when they had an opportunity in that room to say, wait, wait, hold on a second, I'm concerned, and by the way, we know they were concerned, because there was a message saying, I'm very concerned, and yet they didn't even say, we bought him a gun, and we refer to it as his gun. They can't, take a, they can't get away from their own words. Foreseeability is what I have to prove. And when a parent learns of a school shooting and before the shooter is ever even made public, she texts her son, don't do it. I think I've shown foreseeability, but I have a lot of other things that show foreseeability. When a parent, upon hearing that there was a school shooting, goes to his house and looks for the gun because he's worried it's his son, you didn't see any other parents do that. Why? Because he knew it was foreseeable. Your Honor, People v. Fiesel, Michigan Supreme Court from 2010 opinion. Gross negligence occurs when an individual disregards the consequences of their action or inaction while aware of the risks but are indifferent to the foreseeable result. Indifference. There's, this perfectly describes Jennifer and James Crumbly. They were indifferent, but put another way, they just didn't care. I keep thinking about all of the things, just one thing could have prevented this, just one action they did. Lock the gun up, let them know he has a gun, take him home, immediately find him care. And I also keep thinking about the statements in their son's journal. If there was any question about who cared about him, it was settled on that day because he sat there and his parents didn't greet him or touch him or act at all concerned and said, actually, we have to go to work. We can't, we can't do this right now. I think there was no question at that point that no one cared about him. And I think that was actually the final straw for him. Judge, I've proven that the defendants are guilty of involuntary manslaughter. And I have case law, and, and I quoted it, because I follow the law. I don't speculate. We don't bring cases against in, in speculation. And there's one thing I agree with. You're allowed to be a terrible parent. You are allowed to be a terrible parent. And if that's all this was, 
I wouldn't approve it, I wouldn't like it, but we wouldn't be here. And it's true. We don't have this charge very often in these, in these, these cases. You know why? Because I'm not aware of the facts in this case ever being so egregious. It cannot be ignored. It is criminal negligence. Judge, I'm asking you to bind this case over and, and make and allow Jennifer and James Crumbly to stand in front of 12 of their peers where I will then prove that beyond a reasonable doubt they've committed involuntary manslaughter. Thank you. The defendants in this case, that being James Crumbly and Jennifer Crumbly, are each charged with four counts of homicide, involuntary manslaughter, contrary to MCL 750.321. The prosecutor alleges that the defendant's 15-year-old son, Ethan, shot and killed four Oxford High School students with a gun that they purchased for him. Specifically, the complaint in the warrant alleges that the defendants caused the death of Madison Baldwin, Anna St. Juliana, Tate Muir, and Justin Schilling. By committing the, the following acts or acts in a grossly negligent manner, to wit, storing his or her firearm and its ammunition so as to allow access to the firearm and ammunition by his or her minor child, or the gross, grossly negligent failure to perform the following legal duty, to wit, failure to exercise reasonable care, to control his or her minor child so as to prevent him from intentionally harming others or from conducting himself so as to create an unreasonable risk of bodily harm to others knowing that he or she has the ability to control his or her child and knowing of the necessity and the opportunity to do so. The issue to be determined, to be determined by this court is a probable cause standard. In other words, after a preliminary exam, is, it, is there a probable cause to determine that a crime was committed and that the defendants committed the crime? The complaint in the warrant alleges that the defendant's behavior violated Michigan law, which provides that any person who shall commit the crime of manslaughter shall be guilty of a felony punishable by imprisonment in the state prison not more than 15 years or by a fine of not more than $7,500. Because the statute does not define manslaughter, the court must look to common law, case, common law and case law for guidance. It is well established that involuntary manslaughter requires a death caused by the defendant without legal justification or excuse while the defendant was acting in a grossly negligent manner or while committing an unlawful act which was inherently dangerous to human life. That is quoted in People v. Moscow, 170 Mishap, 340, a 1988 case. In 2018, the Michigan Court of Appeals addressed the common law basis for involuntary manslaughter and the threshold for gross negligence. In People v. Head, 323 Mishap, 526, a father was convicted of involuntary manslaughter after his 10-year-old daughter accidentally shot and killed his 9-year-old son with a gun that the defendant stored loaded in an unlocked closet. Apparently at the time, the 10-year-old was attempting to reenact a scene from a violent video game they were allowed to play unsupervised in that same room. The court held that allowing children to play unsupervised in a bedroom in which a loaded gun was stored amounted to gross negligence on the part of the father. The Court of Appeals went on to hold that involuntary manslaughter is a catch-all crime for all, any homicides that do not constitute murder, voluntary manslaughter, or an otherwise, otherwise justified, excusable homicide. In its opinion, the court noted that the requisites mental state for the defendant is gross negligence, which means wantonness and disregard of the consequences that may ensue. To prove gross negligence, a prosecutor must show, one, knowledge of a situation requiring the exercise of ordinary care and diligence to avert injury to another. Two, ability to avoid the resulting harm by ordinary care and diligence in the use of the means at hand. And three, the omission or the failure to use such care and diligence to avert the threatened danger went to the ordinary mind and must be apparent that the result is likely to prove disastrous to another. It is cited in the head case. In the head case, the court determined that while the defendant was not personally aware that his child would accidentally shoot and kill his other child, or that he was aware that he knowingly created that possibility, 
the defendant did disregard the risk and the danger of a nine and ten year old of nine and ten year old children playing unsupervised in a room where a firearm was accessible. In fact, the court stated, quote, it goes without saying that a loaded shotgun poses a danger to young children who are not being monitored by an adult. Defendant had the ability to avoid the harm by exercising ordinary care and diligence. By allowing his young children to play unsupervised in a room where he kept a loaded, readily accessible shotgun, defendant failed to use the requisite care and diligence. He failed to avert a threatened danger where the result was likely to prove, to prove disastrous to his children. Therefore, we conclude that there was sufficient evidence of gross negligence. That court also addressed the factual and proximate causation elements of involuntary manslaughter when it held that it was beyond question that factual causation existed. But for the defendant keeping a loaded shotgun in an unlocked closet of a bedroom where the children were playing without supervision, the shooting would not have occurred. Additionally, the court held that the child's accidentally, accidental firing of the gun was reasonably foreseeable and thus, thus proximate causation existed. Consequently, the head court affirmed the defendant's involuntary manslaughter conviction. In People v. Harris, the court, cited, the court stated the following, the crime of involuntary manslaughter does not require that the defendant be personally aware of the danger or that he knowingly and consciously create the danger. The test only requires the danger to be apparent to the ordinary mind. That's 159 Mish App, 401, 1987, also citing People v. Seeley, 136 Mish App, 168. In Harris, the defendant was charged with murder after he confronted his daughter's ex-boyfriend with a gun, and upon racking the gun, a shot discharged, and the defendant immediately stated that he did not mean to shoot the victim. At the exam, the magistrate determined the shooting was an accident, so he dismissed the murder charge. On appeal, the court held that the magistrate abused his discretion by dismissing the case entirely because evidence presented at the exam supported a probable cause finding of involuntary manslaughter. The court relied on the or factors, which, the court, which this court previously cited, and further held that the test for involuntary manslaughter under a gross negligence theory only requires the danger to be apparent to the ordinary mind, and the killing certainly could have been avoided by exercise of ordinary care and diligence by the defendant in the use of a firearm. Therefore, in this case, after hearing extensive evidence, extensive testimony, as well as evidence in reviewing and viewing extensive exhibits, the court finds that the deaths of the four victims could have been avoided if James and Jennifer Crumbly exercised ordinary care and diligence in the care of their son. Specifically, the court finds that the prosecutor has shown by a probable cause standard that one, the defendant's son, Ethan Crumbly, presented a danger to the community. Number two, that that danger was apparent to an ordinary mind. Number three, that the defendants, James and Jennifer Crumbly, neglected to diligently address and or divert that danger. And number four, that the danger resulted in the four deaths of the young children at Oxford High School. There was extensive testimony that Ethan Crumbly was certainly a troubled young man and that the defendants had knowledge of that situation. But they purchased a gun, which he believed was his, and that he was free to use. Therefore, the court is binding the defendants over as charged. Any argument on gun? Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, you've heard extensive, obviously you've heard extensive testimony, you've seen exhibits. And, and although the court is binding James and Jennifer over, we are asking that the court reconsider the bond. Um, Your Honor, Ethan Crumbly is incarcerated. Um, James and Jennifer have given this court, they have, they have a, a minimal criminal history as we've gone over previously. We've gone through the factors with the court before. Um, there's, there's no substance abuse issues. There's no failure to appear issues. Judge, we're asking that you reduce the bond, allow them to be released. As the court is aware, we've had numerous issues with, with meeting with our clients while they're incarcerated due to COVID restrictions at the jail. Um, it, it obviously impedes on their ability to meet with us, to, to uh, develop their defense, Judge. So I'm asking the court to reduce their bond to $100,000, 10%. 
response. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. I, you have the same motion as it relates to Jennifer Crumley? Yes, Your Honor. I'll just um, steal what Mariel says. We'll just go with that. Thank you, Judge. From the people, there's been no changes in their status. There's no reason to amend bond. We addressed bond on January the 7th of this year. 6.106 discusses bond and conditions. This court set the bond initially upon arraignment. This court considered a number of factors, including the information contained in the square two, as well as their alleged flight at the time the warrant was issued. On the bond hearing, the prosecuting attorney and myself addressed the likelihood of conviction as well as other factors. The last two hearings we've had in this case have only added to that, Judge. We have provided this court with a snapshot of what the evidence will be at trial. This court has already determined that probable cause does exist as to both defendants on both theories of involuntary manslaughter. As I stated in January the 7th, these defendants will be convicted. They will go to prison. Their guidelines start at prison. We will be asking for a prison sentence, Judge. There's no reason to amend bond. Um, this uh, court did hear extensive argument and uh, testimony during the course of a bond motion that was held on January 7, 2022. Um, after hearing the testimony and also viewing the exhibits in this case, the court uh, finds that there is absolutely no reason for the court to change its uh, position as it relates to bond. Um, the court finds that in accordance with the factors set forth in MCR 6.106, that the defendants in this case um, are, are facing very serious charges, that there is a flight risk given their prior behavior, therefore the court is not going to amend a bond. It is denied that motion. Thank you. 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 Make sure you take all your originals as well. Yes, Judge. Thank you.